Hi, I'm Paul. And I'm Morgan. We're here today to talk about our faith in Jesus Christ. Also, modeling. <laughs> I'll never underwear model. I've said that since I was a child. <laughs> I was like, I knew that one day they'd be knocking down my door saying, Sam, will you underwear model for us? And I was gonna have to be firm in my convictions. I would only underwear model for the LDS church if they were gonna start selling more varieties of underwear and really kind of like, can I just say, Tanner is absolutely sleeping on a modeling career. He has vitiligo. Very trendy in modeling right now. A face that's made for the screen and the camera. I really have thought for a long time that you should be modeling. Yeah, like well, I need modeling. to do a few more sit-ups. But unfortunately, really, I'm out of the really gym because I janked my hip. Well, they want tall no, Elvin. New, mo new modeling like is much more diverse and they that, that's why like vitiligo I feel like is prominent in modeling because it's just something interesting and I feel like a lot of the companies that I like right now like Parade, they're an underwear company and all their advertising is just so inclusive and I think you'd crush it for them. Wow, well if anyone wants to hook me up with a modeling gig so I can stop all this business, that's what Mormons should be doing. If they want us to get a life and a personality, Give send us a little us money to do something different. Jobs. We're not we told you any we'd younger. sell out. We did, we said it from the go, we said money. <laughs> How much money do you think a Mormon would have to give us for us? We'll just quit Zelf forever. But like we could still start another YouTube channel that had nothing to, we just couldn't yeah. talk about Mormonism. Oh, right? oh I'm like two, probably two million, one million each. One million each, easy. 700,000. Easy, easy. <laughs> and on that note, buy our merch. The links are in the description box. Also, you should support us on Patreon because we're, we're two chapters into Jack Whalen's book Stephanie which was a huge hit a desert book in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s and we're just and now a lost. huge hit again here <laughs> we're learning so we're learning so much about drugs and we drug are. culture and quite two weeks ago I didn't even know what quaaludes were I can't believe it like the level of education I've been getting from this Patreon series <laughs> brilliant and uh today's video well you already know it's box you've seen the title but I wanted to talk about this just because I feel like this is something I think about a lot because we left Mormonism in 2015 when stuff that the church had like semi-successfully hidden for generations was starting to really come to the surface. You know, you had front page of the New York Times talking about um, Joseph Smith, you know, the church admitting that Joseph Smith had a bunch of wives. The CES letter, I think, when was the CES letter published? That, that must a couple have been like the mid 2000, the aughts. I think that was 2013. Yeah, 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 that's um, right. But anyway, 2015 stuff was starting to come to the surface. And so I always think like, it's been eight years since then of things getting pushed more and more into the mainstream. You know, we've had all these Netflix, there was Keep Sweet, what was it? Keep Sweet, Pray in a Bay, Mormon No More on Hulu. There's just been so the much. Mark Hoffman. Yeah, Murder Among Mormons. So I'm always just so curious about what the 2023 Mormon experience is like, because I just think, it was, it was hard to kind of be faithful back in the day, but it just seems like it's got exponentially harder. Mm. And so I'm always so curious about the impact that has, I suppose, the mindsets that people have to adopt. Because they've, you'd have always had to have had an extreme mindset to maintain belief in Mormonism, I think, just because it is a high drama religion and they, they make you very psychologically dependent on it. So you've always had to have the mindsets like demonizing former members and, you know, I don't know, just being obsessive in all these various Very ways. Very binary thinking. Yeah. And... But now I'm like, how much weirder has it got? What, what must it be like in 2023? And if you have been Mormon in the last few years, please weigh in in the comments. But what kind of mindsets do you have to be in to survive all that? You know, I think it really does depend on where you are. Mm -hmm. um, because, because you could still live in a bubble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is, there is without a doubt, a big exodus out of the church right now, especially among younger people who are more internet savvy. All this, all, all this trend of talking and the church even opening up a little bit mm -hmm. um, has, of course, been so influenced by <clears throat> social media. Uh, Facebook and Reddit have were huge, and now Twitter and TikTok is probably the... The ex woman subreddit in 2015 had 30,000 members, I remember this vividly, and now I think it's at like 250,000. Wow. The amount that um, being ex woman has been normalized in the last eight years is mm -hmm. wild. I feel like we were... Um, the f like some of the first people to be proudly being like, yeah, we are kind of anti-Mormonism, you know? Mm -hmm. Back then, even in 2015 you had all these people that would create anonymous accounts on Twitter or Reddit, and but 
it was still like quite rare for people to be open mm -hmm. about the fact that they've resigned or they're leaving. They don't believe it. And so, now you see sorry. it constantly. I was going to say so much even that I felt even in our circle of ex-Mormons, there was a lot of kind of this attitude mm. of like, we were a bit extreme for talking so yeah. openly about it. And it's been interesting in the last few years to see that change. Well, they all want to come on our podcast. <laughs> I think as time has gone on, a, a positive change that has been happening is, I think in the past people would leave Mormonism and they were still so mired in those Mormon narratives of like, ex-Mormons are so angry and ex-Mormons can leave, but they can't leave it alone. And there hadn't been enough sort of, there hadn't been enough media created maybe, or the idea hadn't spread enough yet of like why those ideas aren't super valid. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's perfectly healthy to be angry and... Um, Definitely access to stuff. information. Again, depending on location, <clears> like, <throat> you know, the Tanners were doing stuff like, you know, yeah. ex exposing, cross-checking, referencing and things. And for a long time, but they're in Utah. And so you, if you're like living outside of the Mormon corridor, it might be mm -hmm. hard to even just access those materials because there's not a big enough demand for just like average bookstores to sell that kind of yeah. stuff. And uh, also access to community. If you weren't like in a predominantly Mormon area, you likely weren't able to meet up with people like that. So you just kind of integrate into the world. But now with it, um, and what I was going to say earlier is I feel like the church culture is different geographically like the membership experience in California is very different than the one yeah. in Utah and the one in Utah is very different than the one in Brazil and so on and so forth there are like underlying threads and things but you know I think a lot of people are totally oblivious to the exodus that's happening in the church because they're not in the right areas dealing with the yeah. right demographics that is really interesting to me because it feels like surely no one could be that ignorant to how many people have left mm -hmm. But then there are other areas where that's mm -hmm. so obvious and, you know, wards closing down and empty chapels. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just what they're seeing online is more and more being confronted with people talking about it and sharing information. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you see the people who are learning to have conversations and beginning the slow journey of at least becoming familiar with the information to talk intelligibly about it. Mm -hmm. um, but then you also have a bunch of people who are like really doubling down into like Desnat yeah. type ideology. For those I maybe mean, people don't know what Desnat is, it's Deseret Nationalist. So Utah used to be called the territory of Deseret. They wanted it to be called that after a made up word in the Book of Mormon. And they're just kind of the, the QAnon of Mormonism, I suppose. Just very radical black and white, far right, conspiratorial a lot of the time. Yeah, and like openly white nationalist and they constantly theocratic create, and... Oh yeah, theocratic, yeah. They create a lot of accounts to troll us and we just block them every time because it's the type of thing where there's no, there's no sense in engaging because it's not, you're just adding fuel to the fire. So I, we really recommend people don't engage with them. Though I have had a few experiences where I've <laughs> just refuse to like play into the binary and I don't always do that sometimes that I really love being the like <laughs> um but with desnat people. with actual desnat yeah. people where I was either willing to admit a mistake that I had made or to apologize for language I was using or to ask a person questions and kind of like I don't know just reach them on a more human level to people being like wow, you've really changed my mind about ex-Mormons. And it's like, really? Just that one thing like was enough? And then for them to be like, hey, I'm sorry for this. Or I learned something about, um, you know, posting on their main, like the lesson I learned having a conversation with an anti-Mormon. And it's like, oh, I'm glad I could be that for you. I can't always be that for you. <laughs> like the lady this morning who posted a picture of... Uh, Heather Gay, this woman's name is literally Karen, uh, posted a picture of Heather Gay wearing her shirt that was like, bad Mormon. And they were like, whoa, it's so, imagine being so cringe as to make your, the religion used to be your whole identity. And it's like, ma'am, you are literally wearing religiously mandated underwear. Like, I can pull up a, a quote from cringe. David A. Bednar right now where he's like, the church needs to inform every single decision you make, the clothes that you wear, the people you interact with, the, the activities that you do, what you put in your body, what comes out of your body. Like, it's literally affecting every single aspect of your identity. And for you to say, oh, the ex-Mormons make it their whole identity. It's mm -hmm. like, 
you really need to do some serious introspection introspection and take a look at potential hypocrisy that you may be what we hate in others we see in ourselves karen so uh on the theme of this topic of what it's like to be a woman in 2023 i found a reddit post that i thought was really interesting um that i thought i'd just read we'd read together and just kind of unpack by windchill the magician so this person's post says and this was on the ex woman subreddit A few observations made from a recent visit to the troubled end times world of my aging boomer TBM siblings. For those of you who don't know TBM, is it true believing Mormon? Mm -hmm. Truly Mormon. Uh, Living for over 50 years as Mormons battling Satan and the satanic Gentile world 24-7 and maintaining the conspiracy theory mindset that explains setbacks, failures etc. within the confines of the 19th century Mormon theology. I thought that it would be funny to troll my family with my taper t-shirt objectively funny <laughs> <laughs> remember when we did that first and then everyone ripped us off and we just couldn't be bothered to do anything about oh, it oh I almost sent a message to there's an ex-Mormon t-shirt company that's literally did selling exact the exact design. shirt that yeah. I that I put together years ago and I wanted to be like and they're like isn't being a Mormon so cringe and I was like yeah so is stealing stealing like, people's work <laughs> but then I was like I can't be bothered I don't, I don't want to be I don't care I don't care But we do care about our current merch. I thought that it would be funny to troll my family with my Taper t-shirt. Taper, for those of you who don't know, is what Mormon apologists have said horse referred to in the Book of Mormon because there weren't horses in Book of Mormon times in that location. Um, And it's kind of funny because a Taper looks like this. Um, But once there and hearing the sad stories of the ex-Mormon nieces and nephews and having conversations with my TBM siblings, there was nothing funny in any of it. It was only incredibly sad. Damage, dysfunction, hurt and alienated kids. Adults making decisions like taking inheritance money meant for kids and investing it in food storage and giving that to the ex-Mormon kids. None of it wanted. All kids needed the money. Adults making crazy and hurtful decisions based on magic dreams. TBM parents can't see how their singular focus on the cult disconnected them from the kids they love. The kids see the adults love the cult more. TBM adults who have lived with the belief that all government is evil now face poor health, have no savings, and need to be on disability. They're not helped by their one true church, and they need to turn to the great satanic force in the latter days, and they don't know how. I think she's referring to, like, government assistance. The TBM adults must live with a tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance as they face the reality of things. Jesus never came back, they have no savings, and the ex-Mormons are living happier, more stable lives. I'll never know what their lives, our lives, would have been like had we not converted long ago, but where 50-plus years of Mormonism has left them is just sad. That I just that I just found that <laughs> post kind of powerful and it's really real to people. Like people will comment saying, "How can Mormons be so dumb and crazy to believe any of this stuff?" There was actually a really good Mormon stories episode like last week with John Larson where he really talked about this. Um, but they're victims of a Hydamon group that has exerted control over their psyche and their entire lives most of the time since they were children, which is incredibly hard to part from. Thinking about children and their parents being disconnected really makes me sad because I mean first of all kids have grown up in a more internet connected world but also younger people have more flexible brains it's slightly easier for younger people to change their beliefs than older people it is just really sad to imagine how there is kind of this really um quite real barrier that just can feel that seems a bit insurmountable because it's like how do you if someone doesn't want to hear the truth about their church or, or literally does not possess like the ability to really because their psyche does not believe it's safe to listen to criticisms of the church and they just they get so dysregulated in their nervous system when their kids maybe bring up reasons why you know they have left the church or reasons why they're taking a step back it, it just makes me really sad that there's this very real wall between children and their parents, like what should be the most unconditionally loving relationship among humanity has been co-opted by this organization. And now it's, I feel like it's going to happen more and more because, you know, young people are online. Mm. Old people are online too, but... Not the same way. Different. <laughs> I think you highlighted uh, exactly part of the grief of the ex-Mormon experience is that you realize that the church has kept you in this like 
prison of fear Mm -hmm. and has cut you off from so many sources of joy uh, in the world, keeping you isolated as the sole source of truth and the sole arbiter of morality and... Again, telling you what kind of relationships you have, telling you what you have to wear, making you so afraid of the world. And, you know, people, when they leave that, you know, it's, it's what you have to grieve that of realizing that, like, you, your relationship with the people you care most about is always, like, filtered through that thing. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's hard. I think that's probably the hardest thing that people go through. And the one we get questioned about the most is, like, how do I live with family that is like viewing me through this wild binary apocalyptic conspiratorial judgmental lens? Mm-hmm. And I'd That's say that's just the reality for a big. Ch- I'd say more than fifty percent of ex Mormons mm-hmm. are living with that reality. Ooh, just felt like the you know from the Nexium documentary where they mm. talked about the teenage girl he kept in that room for like two years alone. And it was like, well, she could have walked out any time. And it was like, but she couldn't. She was Mm -hmm. too afraid and like warped by the system that had been grooming her and this person who had been grooming her since she was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Like, that's hard to undo until you get to the point where it's happened. And then you look back and you're like, oh, holy shit. That's why people think they're like, oh, you guys never were true believing Mormons. You never cared. You're just bitter, bitter, bitter. And all you want to do is complain and see the bad in every situation. Whereas if you knew us when we were Mormons, we were literally the most... (laughs) Very overzealous. EFY counselor, obviously, as you can tell, self-evident. And, uh, you know, like very enthusiastic about it to the point where the reason that my faith unraveled is because people were coming to us with questions about the church and because they thought, you know, they thought that I was somebody who had studied it and lived it and, Mm -hmm. and all that. And, um, it's like, you don't realize till you're unraveling all that, the price that was paid for the few sparks of joy you enjoyed in the church Mm -hmm. and for the facade that it makes you carry in its defense when it is cutting you off again from so many sources of joy. I think that something that is so hard again with the parents and the kids is a lot, especially if we're looking at areas like Utah, a lot of older Mormons, they had decades to be indoctrinated and to really, cause you know, the older you get, the, the longer patterns go on, the more deeply wired they are, the harder it is to get out of them. You know, that's like kind of a basic fact about the brain. They had decades of indoctrination before any, potentially any other re- really significant piece of evidence snuck in there mm-hmm. and their psyche was presented with it. So, you know, if you didn't encounter really any criticisms of the church that were legitimate, as a, you know, maybe you went on your mission and there were like people that loved the Bible that like tried to get you, but that's not really gonna, you know, affect that many people that much. But if you made it decades and decades and decades before hearing anything negative, that, that's such a different story than like by the time you're 15, you're hearing whisperings and you're seeing content. And it's just tough because you are up against like the way the brain works, the structure of the brain. Mm-hmm. And it's it's easy when you're the, the child in the situation, for example, to feel like if they loved me, they would. But it's just so complicated. Like it's not... Um, if it's going to always feel so personal, but it truly isn't. But then the fact that it's not personal is also so hurtful because it's like, how can my, yeah, mm-hmm. how can my experience not matter to you? But that's just biological reality a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking about how the church literally just siphons off people's life force mm-hmm. and makes them unable to truly have a joyful experience in life. Again, I want to be careful because, of course, Mormons can experience joy and I don't want to buy into the binary of like, oh, you never are happy and you're faking it like exactly what they say about us. Because like I experienced happiness in Mormonism Mm -hmm. and joy in Mormonism. But then again, it was like realizing the price wasn't worth it and it was uh, under conditions that I didn't consent to and that were uh, exploitative, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But just thinking about how, like, if you're telling people their whole lives that the world is a fallen, evil, wicked place, and the only thing that matters is your mansion in heaven where you're going to see your dead relatives who are way more important than your living relatives, and you've got to live for that by, again, giving up your life force, all your time and talents and all that you possess and may possess for the building up of the kingdom of God. And by 
not trusting your natural self. You know, right. that the natural man is an enemy to God is a fundamental tenet of Mormonism. So you can never kind of get the... Because, yeah, Mormons can obviously feel happiness and joy and blah, blah, blah. But you, it's hard to ever feel truly content in kind of a larger way about your life when you when you don't trust yourself. You feel like if you relax for too long or, you know, you don't read your scriptures for a few days or that, that you know, things are going to go to shit because you're just so naturally sinful and an enemy to God. Mm -hmm. That's a really... It's really hard to make a case for someone being able to have those beliefs, which are core to Mormonism, and then also be genuinely like content and peaceful in life. Not that we have to be peaceful all the time, but you know what I'm mm. saying. You know, I see Mormon peace and have encountered mm -hmm. uh, peaceful people, but it's always, you see how fragile that peace is when it's confronted with the, le the slightest contradiction yeah. or evidence to the contrary, or a lifestyle that's different than what is normative for you, that piece vanishes like mm -hmm. that. It can't withstand the slightest pushing. It's a peace, peaceful house of cards, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. If you're just like hating the world and always so paranoid of your own experience, because it's not just like, oh, I don't trust myself. It's like, I am on hyper alert constantly uh filtering every thought i have through either like it's god or it's satan or it's me and i'm not exactly sure how to discern between the two so just like you're at war with yourself that's how i was i was at war with myself just viewing myself as this carnal fallen thing so prone to sin and oh wretched man that i am like it's like i'm actually fine <laughs> it's funny i see these memes going around about jesus like um, because, you know, the more woke generation is like, Jesus doesn't want us to, like, be ang anxious. Like, he, he knows he works with our depression and our anxiety. And, like, he wants us to take it easier on ourselves. And, you know, he carries our burdens so that we don't have to be... And it's like, he's the one that is apparently giving to you in the first place. You know, he's like, you're so wicked and fallen and I've saved you because you're a piece of shit. And I died on the fucking cross for you and you better be fucking grateful. And you know how you can show your great gratitude? By not thinking of yourself as a piece of shit or fallen horrible. Yeah. But, you know, it's yeah. like... <laughs> The healthiest Mormons in the church right now are the ones who are a, like starting to be able to get away from those mindsets of shame and guilt. But the issue there is that shame and guilt is the primary control tactic for high demand religions and cults. And that is what has made groups like Mormonism, of all kinds of Mormonism, so successful throughout history. So it, yeah, there are ways that people are finding to be able to exist in the church and not take on all of its uh, harmful teachings. But... I do feel like that makes them more vulnerable to losing their faith. And what's scary is since the church is theocratically patriarchal, like mm -hmm. literally the highest order of temple is called the patriarchal order and the highest grip you give is the patriarchal grip. Mm -hmm. And it's so it's hilarious that they would even pretend to be like, oh yeah, both genders are equal. Just this one is the most equal and important. Mm -hmm. Like where's the mat the matriarchal grip? Where's the matri... You know, I like that. Tangent. Anyway, um, what happens is, you know, thinking about thoughts and like, is it God or Satan? For a certain demographic, aka those with penises, I think that paranoia actually uh, turns into something far more insidious, mm. which is the, conf uh, instead of being like, oh, I, I'm, you know, I have the, at least the humility to question where my thoughts are coming from. I think that there is a certain segment of the group that is encouraged to conflate their will with God's yeah. and to presume that they are God's living mouthpiece and whatever they do is right, mm -hmm. especially those among them who have had their calling and election made sure, where they're told that no matter what they do, they are guaranteed exaltation mm -hmm. uh, from this point on and who literally think themselves above the ability to sin. Like... That's yeah. just really, really crazy. And so you see a lot of those guys, you know, I mean, how many men who are, again, walking around thinking, like, I have the literal authority and power of God, and it's your job to submit to me. Like, I speak for him. Mm. That's really scary. I actually didn't really realize while well, Mormon how real the sort of patriarchal order of things was within Mormon marriages. Like, I think I just had this idea that 
Mormon marriages were still 50-50, but I've come to realize that there is a lot of, within a lot of Mormon marriages, the man does kind of have the final word. The man's priesthood power is kind of seen as the trump card. The man is the head, the woman is the neck. She turns his head and tells him where to look, mm-hmm. though. That's like so yoga with Adrian control. and me. <laughs> uh, I was thinking the quote popped into my head from C.S. Lewis, who said that the people who do most for this world are the ones who think most about the next. And mm. I actually totally disagree. I just listened to, a little while ago, this uh, lecture by the philosopher Zizek, and he had a long treatise on the worst offenders as far as like human rights abuses, mass murders, et cetera, of the people in history. And practically all of them were those who were thinking about the next life. And it was, that was necessary to being able to do that, to dissociate from the present moment and the people who are living and breathing right in front of you Mm. in favor of some abstract concept of what's going on in the world with you at its centerpiece. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about more about that post and the apocalypse of the whole situation and how that is just like built into LDS theology, Mm -hmm. literally in the name Latter-day Saints. First of all, it's hilarious that the return of Jesus Christ has always been imminent. The writers of the Bible believed it was imminent. John, the revelator, believed it was imminent in his lifetime. And then for the next 2,000 years, they've been saying, Jesus is coming back any day now, and that's why we need to kill the Muslims and the Jews and anyone who disagrees with us so that we can prepare the world for the second imminent second coming. And that's why we need to colonize America to build up the new Jerusalem for yeah, the, the imminent Greek return of Christ. Linear, you know, it's a and real <laughs> There's denial, there's anger. And then, you know, J- uh, Joseph Smith believed that it was going to happen in his lifetime. Many failed prophecies about the second coming of Jesus being, again, so imminent any day now. And how that's just cooked into the organization and the philosophical structure of these people. But I just... It's no apocalyptic ideology is ever, ever going to be capable of creating solutions for the real world because they don't want to see the world healed. They don't want to see a system where everyone can live in peace together. They don't want to see a system where everyone's needs can be taken care of and that people can live the most fulfilling lives without having to do the most uh, egregious types of labor and giving their body, heart, and mind to some machine so that some psychopath can make a gajillion dollars off the sweat, sweat, blood, and blood and tears of the average worker. They don't want to see that happen because it's totally contradictory to their theology. What they believe is that the world has to get worse and worse and worse, and there has to be more and more fighting and more and more pestilences and more and more famines and more and more floods. It doesn't have to do with climate change, mind you. It's just based on wickedness. We should be able to abuse and exploit the environment endlessly for our own gain. That is not a problem with God. God hates gay people, and that's why he's causing the floods and famines and pestilences and wars, etc. And then, <laughs> I forgot where I was even going with that, other than... Uh, like, apocalyptic religion. Apocalyptic religion. They're never going to find a solution for that because they don't want it. They want for the world to get worse and worse and follow apart so that some savior from the sky can come save us. Mm-hmm. Like, they don't want to offer real world solutions. They don't want to see prosperity. They don't want to see healing. Like, mm-hmm. it would undermine their whole latter day saintism. So, obviously, we left Mormonism in, uh, in our early 20s, but when I imagine. When I imagine being a Mormon in your 50s, I imagine it would... Because I think every generation, every younger generation kind of... You know, when you're in your late teens, early 20s, there's just a specific energy about life at that age where it just feels like anything can happen. And like, we are a special generation because you are seeing Mm -hmm. ways that your generation is like wildly innovative and different from the... You know, Mm -hmm. I think you just have that general sense as a teenager and in your 20s. And... So, like, hearing about Mormon last days stuff was like, ooh, yeah. But then I just feel like over decades just continuing to believe (laughs) in that, like, we're on the cusp. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I just, it's got to get you down. Like, regardless of whether you think it's going to happen at a certain time, which, by the way, Mormons are hoping for it to happen sooner rather than later, right? I think because a lot of them are bored. Can I be real (laughs) about that? Oh, yeah. Like, if I was Mormon, I'd be like, yeah, let's get some burning going. There's nothing going on. It's just got to be so boring being Mormon year after year and not really... I mean, you there's obviously perceived payoff or maybe real payoff, but... Yeah, you're you're hoping for a much bigger payoff, and it, you want it to come sooner. You're living in a comic book religion that's yeah. selling a comic book fantasy, but only offering you 
like a Mervin's experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I asked. Uh, I don't remember Mervin's. <laughs> no, I don't know what you're on about. It's just a department store that sucks and went under. Mm. I think I think they're all gone. Y'all remember Index? <laughs> so I asked. First of all, I asked on Reddit for people who have been fully Mormon in the last few years what the hardest part was because I was curious about this question because we went we were Mormon for eight years and. Uh, one comment says, honestly, one of the hardest things for me and something it is so nice not having to do now was having to try and figure out a way to be okay with whatever the bad PR story of the month for the church was, whether it was about how money was being spent, some stupid policy or a leader saying something icky. As a TBM, you have to twist it in your head to make it okay. But now I can just agree that terrible things are terrible. Also, going back to your other point, when we're talking about peace, I really do think... You, you cultivate a lot of peace in your life when you get better at being able to just let people have different opinions to you without allowing it to dysregulate you. Or when mm. it does dysregulate you, taking the time to regulate your system again. Because, I mean, th- again, this is kind of part of my fascination, this topic. As a Mormon in 2023, I imagine there's constant assaults on your nervous system because you're, you know, you open Instagram and you see someone's like, why I'm living Mormonism or, you know, the news is reporting on Mormonism or you've just got all these uh, inputs that mm. are pretty constant if you're online, which most people are a lot. I mean, I guess you can just block it all out. Like maybe some people are able to just have nothing affect them because they've just decided that it's all... But I, I, from being Mormon, I feel like if I saw anything negative, it kind of like your heart's increasing and you feel kind of sick. And mm. I just feel like you'd live in that state a lot more. It's and so it just much... makes you so sad. So sad for the yeah. world. So sad for everyone who's trying to just find the worst and undermine faith when we're literally just trying to hang sad. on. <laughs> yeah. I think it's healthy to, to realize that all, all kinds of fucked up views exist in this world. And you, you can't let that destroy you. And you need to figure out how to like exist in harmony with opposing viewpoints, it's a lot easier to do that when your viewpoints aren't so fixed or aren't so, you know, you don't see them as central to who you are and your ability to be okay. Someone else on this post said, the last few years of my TBM life were about 2015 to 2019. I really started a lot of deconstruction in 2019. Before that, I was 100% ain't nothing gonna break my stride TBM. The hardest part of being TBM in those last few years was having really inadequate answers for so many deep questions. This is something I think about constantly. Not just life, the universe and everything questions, but like how do I explain the world's current problems, let alone start to figure out how to respond to them. I think the Mormon way is just to ignore that they're really happening. Just kind of uh, pay homage to them in some abstract, vague line at General Conference and then move on. Mm-hmm. It's funny, uh, The <clears throat> there was just an article in the Trib about um, the church asking the church schools to put more emphasis on the teachings of the church Ooh. as opposed to secular learning. At BYU. Yeah. So, oh, that's actually huge. That shows that they are doubling down then. Oh, yeah. And, and there was just another series of series of firings and mm. uh, more liberal professor, professors suddenly quitting and not being able to talk about it due to the NDA they sign at the beginning. Always fun when the group you criticize online for a living uh, in the state that you live in is becoming more radical. So well, this thing. is pretty. Uh, this is pretty standard playbook for them. Always has been. Yeah. <laughs> At least they're not burning down printing presses anymore. <laughs> well, <laughs> if we ever go missing. Okay, this person continued. The hardest part of leaving, in a way, was grieving. Just being so sad for all the heroes I lost, all the beautiful framework that splintered and came crashing down. All the stuff I had set up around me to help me feel safe and keep me in a box. Losing all of that felt like losing a loved one, like losing a deep part of myself. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Smith, man, I would shake my head. Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. I am just, I'm so sad, man. I believed you were a prophet. I testified of you. I stood up for you. I defended you. I sacrificed for you. And the Book of Mormon, I spent so much time, so many years treating it as my favorite book in the whole world, trying to memorize whole chunks of it, studying it in great detail. It hurt like a mother to lose all of that. Yeah, the oh, reading yeah. time alone. <laughs> grieving the reading time alone. I'm pretty removed from the like Mormon grief. Like I don't, mm-hmm. but reading that really does mm-hmm. take me back to that place of just like true, true grieving, true, true loss. Just feeling like 
something has truly died like your best and friend. when you're on the edge of tipping into the full like, full grief because you're still hanging on i think that's the most terrifying part when everything in you like knows what's coming in a way mm-hmm. and you're just like manically desperately like reading or doing what you can and it's it's funny because i feel like the rage and anger doesn't come usually till later like mm. usually it's just a a tragic loss for people Mm -hmm. just once that once the light the switch flicks you know it's like oh Mm -hmm. I've been had it's very sad and then later you realize all the ways and then you're like wait a second wait a second I feel like that happens in relationships sometimes too you break up it's very sad heartfelt and then as time goes on you're kind of like huh (laughs) (laughs) not me I do all my anger up front (laughs) to deny the sadness (laughs) yeah that is uh, my heart goes out to that person and to anyone in that experience. And it's not just a Mormon thing, right? I think it's funny. These days we get just as many comments from yeah. people who have Jehovah's never been Mormon. Witnesses, uh, ex-evangelicals, ex-evangelicals, ex-Catholics. Um, yeah. And so this seems to be a pretty common experience. And mm-hmm. as we're seeing like a general trend in the world of people walking away from religion out of more like a moral sensibility and uh, intellectual just saying mm-hmm. like this doesn't add <clears throat> up and it's kind of funny about all this is like any anything that a, a Mormon a believer could say about something just with the slightest tugging on the principle to see what it's like rooted in in the context would unravel the whole tapestry mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you know someone says something like oh well God created this and then you're like okay let's talk about the creationism process like do you really think and what you realize again it's like that it's a house of cards it's mm-hmm. not based on anything real it's all these like vague concepts of stories and things that don't have to square with the real world i don't have i don't think about it yeah it's like don't don't ask me more after i just know the answers i know the the surface layer answers to the question which is why they focus on reading the scriptures reading the scriptures is because they don't want you reading other things that could enhance your conception of the world that could be at odds with what they're saying especially because back in joseph smith's day and throughout most of the church's history Books were your main source of media. You didn't have TV. You didn't have the internet. So Mormons really were able to stay in this bubble till the internet. And you can't burn down the internet. (laughs) So continuing on with answers to hardest part about being TBM in the last few years. Someone said, battling the guilt of not wanting to participate in every meeting or event or the temple enough. It seems like a lot of people left during the pandemic because just getting space was really healthy for them. Mm-hmm. And also they realized how much they didn't enjoy going to church because <laughs> for the first time in their lives, they were... They didn't have they to. They didn't have to. I mean, it is powerful even just letting yourself acknowledge that church is, is really boring and like I don't really get much out of it. And I, get mo- and I, I bet a lot of people also s- have stayed Mormon, but they're like, I just get more out of studying by myself than going to the church a lot mm. of time. And what... And it's like there is something about the social connections had at church that mm-hmm. make it uh, somewhat rewarding. Mm-hmm. But like the actual substance is usually mm-hmm. quite difficult to get through. Unless you got someone scratching your back, a Mormon classic. Yeah. <laughs> or you're like me and you doodle. <laughs> me in sacrament meeting was just like drawing scripture characters all like really cut and muscular. <laughs> and how, yeah. how you just wonder. <laughs> Someone said, knowing much of the teachings didn't align with me, but thinking that a miracle in my life when it meant it was true. It seems like a lot of people will have a sense of how the teachings aren't good or helpful to them, but you, you still have all these layers of conditioning that, you know, anything seemingly miraculous that happens, that's a sign that the church is true. Everything has been mm-hmm. set up to confirm that the church is true. So until you become willing to confront whether it is... Uh, you just kind of have to live with that discomfort, which people do for a lifetime, I think. Oh, yeah. The miracles thing is so funny. Everyone's like, I just can't deny the miracles I've witnessed, the experiences I've had. Um, it is interesting that God only re- only performs certain miracles that could also feasibly occur under just a scientific, rational perspective of the world. That's just interesting. God's never healed mm-hmm. an amputee, which is just interesting. I'm just saying it's interesting. So when people are like, oh, I just can't deny the miracles... All the feasible miracles that exist and happen in Mormonism happen in every mm-hmm. other denomination and religion in the world. Hindu culture is full of stories of miracles. Um, the Catholics have a whole shtick about people who perform miracles and then get become saints, you know? <clears throat> it's like, if you think you're the only person who believes in miracles, which 
it, it, when you break it down, is really just like something happened that feels personal that I can't explain. And you can take God out of that. You can take the church out of it and still have tons of things. Everybody experiences, regardless of their religion, things that feel deeply personal that they can't explain. And if you think, oh, well, you know, God will still give non-Mormon people access to miracles... I mean, then it could be just as true that some god of a different church gives you access to miracles because you have a portion of the truth, like any way you spin it, you know. Mm -hmm. And if it's things like, I heard a voice saying, the Book of Mormon is true. There's also plenty of of explanations for that that fall perfectly into our understanding of how the brain works. I thought that, like, I can't deny the testimony that I have. And it's like, well, when I learned how those feelings and experiences are conjured, Literally by pe- like in every single faith, it didn't I just had to let go of my sense of superiority and like having a personal connection with the God who loves me. Like I had to let go of that. But those experience I still have those meaningful transcendent experiences and that's great. It's just part of human life and doesn't have to be related to the church. You know what they're saying, I just can't deny the experience I've had. I mean, that's a true statement. <laughs> it's like you're, literally <laughs> you did your have psyche an cannot do that at this moment <laughs> in time. Someone said, progressive Mormonism comes with a weird mantle of saviorism. I felt like I had to save all the gay kids in my ward. It feels impossible to leave when you're told the only good you can do is inside. That does have to be tough. There are a lot of I personally am not into the whole trying to change the church by staying. I think I wonder how honest that even is as an assessment of why people are staying. I mean, I don't want if someone says that, fair enough. Um, and I'm sure there are situations where, you know, for example, there are gay kids in your ward and you think about what it would mean for them if you weren't there anymore. And, you know, I can see stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But I also feel like a lot of the time it is a bit of a cop out. It's like a way to not have to fully confront your what you now know is is true about you and the church Mm -hmm. and so maybe it's a justification for just not feeling able to quit the social structure and to quit the organization Mm -hmm. no judgment but i just can't imagine it being healthy for anyone to try and change a billion dollar system multi-billion dollar system from the inside and also the the savior thing of trying to like constantly save other people i still struggle with uh, to some degree, I've, I've got better over the years. Uh, I used to just have no boundaries because the church is has had invaded every single boundary. Mm, you had. really didn't. Yeah, and <laughs> so like any time there was any person who, as I perceived of needing anything, I was just like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And I got myself into a, like horrible situations with people who totally exploited that or mm. who like did not have my best intentions at heart. You because were, they were just like, oh yeah, a person who will give me endless validation and affirmation and, and anything that I ask for. And mm-hmm. they weren't afraid to over ask or take. Mm-hmm. And like, I, now I'm at the point where I'm getting better at just being like, you know what? I don't have to be everything for everybody. And it's funny how we, I feel like we've kind of, I know our, our, our personalities have like it's true, isn't balanced it? out a bit <laughs> in the that Dow. way. <laughs> Yeah, it is interesting how I've become a bit more of a people pleaser. But it's almost because it was in response to realizing how unaware I'd been for so long. (laughs) I don't know, right? It's a swinging thing. It really is the swinging thing. You know, I never had bad intentions, but I just like was not aware of like the ways I came across or the ways I was or just anything. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't very self-aware basically until I was about 23. Started to gain some self-awareness at 23. Self-knowledge. Self-knowledge, yeah. <laughs> Went on a corporate retreat. <laughs> now it's almost like an overcompensation because I'm like, oh God, please can people like me? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm so. like, if you don't like me, not my problem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's in the past that I used to just like, I would still have social anxiety, but I swear I just didn't. It's almost like I wasn't conscious enough to even realize that like other people have thoughts about you. I, I mm. almost just thought like, even if I like said a joke that I knew hurt someone's feelings, in my mind, I'm like, that's not a big deal. And they'll be over it in two seconds because mm-hmm. I was over it in two seconds. I didn't mm-hmm. think about someone going home and potentially stewing on you, insulting them or, you know, I'm not saying I was like this terrible person, but mm-hmm. there are just so many things I wasn't, I just didn't think that people thought about me that much, but then also was like weirdly narcissistic in that mm-hmm. whole thing. Someone said the hardest thing was trying to honestly share my voice as a woman in leadership, only to have it over and over again silenced. And obviously when they say leadership, they mean the levels of leadership women are allowed to reach in the Mormon church. That 
So true, bestie. We, <laughs> what we just talked about is <coughs> the patriarchy will always prefer, support, empower the experiences and preferences of men over women's. That is what it exists to do. Final thing I'll read out. I asked on Twitter, for those of you who have been fully Mormon in the last few years, how did you survive all the people leaving, online discourse, controversi- controversies, etc.? Someone said, simple, I didn't know about any of it. My parents and community did absolutely everything in their power to ensure I didn't get my hands on even a speck of info that wasn't faith-promoting. I left immediately after finding the truth via unmonitored internet connection. Beautiful. It is funny how we've seen <clears throat> the church kind of go back and forth from the idea of like what they, what they call inoculation, which is exposing people to as little enough of the information to convince them that the debate is settled and the church has come out victorious mm. while not actually having to peer deeper into what's going on. It is weird how they say inoculation when it's like, literally we're talking about disease viruses mm-hmm. that are harmful to people. That's what you're equating yourself to. Just interesting. So there's like a little bit of that and the church has come forward and shown the temple where, so it doesn't seem so mm. uh, bizarre when people first encounter it or the gospel topics essays where they're putting more out on the table to say like see we're we're being open Mm -hmm. but then also the attitude of now i think we're seeing a pushback with nelson's regime of like listen to okay we we went a little far with that make sure you're just listening to us (laughs) yeah it does feel like they're step taking a few steps back on the like well actually prophets are pretty perfect and you should stick with us. <laughs> but all you're saying is, like, stick with us. That's, like, it, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. It's, like, always listen to me. And then the thing that I'm saying is always listen to me. Are you going to listen to a known expert in the <laughs> field? Or are you going to listen to me, a guy sitting on $100 billion for Jesus? <laughs> so I wanted to end with this fi- this post from the Facebook page for Preach My Gospel, which in Mormonism is the manual that missionaries use. So this, I think, characterizes how a lot of members view what is happening right now, because obviously they can't, most of the time, it's not psychologically safe, doesn't feel psychologically safe for them to confront the fact that we are all leaving for the reasons we say we are, and that those reasons have validity. So anyway, listen to this post. Church members will live in this wheat and tares situation until the millennium. Already such a binary perspective on life. (laughs) Some real tears even masquerade as wheat, including the few eager individuals who lecture the rest of us about church doctrines in which they no longer believe. First of all, I just want to flag that because I think think it's very important that people who have knowledge of the doctrines the church has actually taught, both, you know, things that are currently still technically doctrines, things that maybe have been like semi-disavowed that were true in the past, like those things are important to talk about because they all help paint a picture of who Joseph Smith was, what this organization actually is, what it has been. So the, the, even just the wording of the few individuals who lecture the rest of us, it's, it, I don't think it's that we're trying to lecture. It is literally that we're just trying to inform or educate. And because we didn't know those things, when we're in Mormonism, and it's hugely important, like the number of Mormon doctrines that just get swept under the rug while the church says that doctrines are unchanging, blah, blah, blah. And it's, I mean, again, the binary approach of like, there are two types of people in this world, the good people and the bad people. The good people agree with me, and the bad people who are not part of this little group aren't allowed to talk about anything. It's so unhealthy, I think, to see yourself as good or bad, rather than just every single human is a mix of good and bad. And we all have helpful behaviors, we all have harmful behaviors, we all can hurt. We all have and biases and prejudices. It's like and seeing yourself as good and only good, or seeing yourself as bad and only bad, both of those are not healthy ways to live. No. Uh, they criticize the use of church resources to which they no longer contribute. Again, I would argue that if you are someone who donated 10% of your income for potentially <laughs> decades of your life to an organization because you believed that they were doing humanitarian work and all this stuff, and then you come to find out that the church spends your money completely differently than they you know, pretended like they did, whether directly or indirectly, you deserve to talk about that. And I think everyone who's donating 10% of their income to any organization deserves to know how that money is being spent. Yeah. So I'm surprised that this made it in like one of the first things that the Preach My Gospel post will mention. I know that there are Mormons who will defend anything, but it's like, 
Who is ever against financial transparency? I just feel like in general <laughs> in life, that's going to be a good idea. You want to mm-hmm. know how the government's spending your money if you're going to have to pay taxes. Mm-hmm. You're going to want to know. And it even feels more important to know what the ODS church is doing because there, you technically can opt out of that 10%. You can't really opt out of taxes unless you're a billionaire. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you definitely should know when it might impact whether or not you give them. Mm. Taxes is like, you're screwed anyway, maybe don't depress yourself. You know? <laughs> it's a new weapon, that's what it's being spent on, that's what you need to know. The Bible says that true religion undefiled is to visit the houseless and the orphan and the widow and to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, etc. That was what Jesus' whole shtick was about. He said that it's harder for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich person to go through heaven. And no, there is no gate in the wall of Jerusalem called the eye of a needle that was invented by Christians who were trying to make the thing make sense. So it's interesting that the religion claiming, the church claiming to be the one true religion of Jesus Christ, and in fact, they've said recently that you can substitute the name of church for Jesus. They're synonymous. They are the exact same thing. It's just funny that the person who said all those things about what true religion is would spend more money on a multi-billion dollar luxury shopping mall than it would to address, say, the booming houseless crisis in Salt Lake City, you know? like <laughs> A shopping mall filled with stores that are some of the worst environmental polluters, the worst uh, labor conditions in their factories, the, the, the types of companies, like Forever 21 was in that mall. <laughs> All kinds of these companies that are doing... The finest apparels and silken threads. Doing untold damage to our planet and to poor people around the world because they're the people that feel the effects of the environmental crisis the soonest and the worst. Like, just no... It's not like they were filling it with Deseret books, even. You know what I mean? It's like, these were the shittiest stores. Like, this... I can't wrap my head around the ways that Mormonism so successfully seems to, like, separate itself from, like, any... (sighs) any like modern issues like that like Mm. fast fashion not even on the lord's mouthpiece's radar and i'm like that's one of the like biggest issues in our world is the fast fashion (laughs) industry it's like one of the single worst industries on the face of the planet and it's just like nothing it's just like business first god's a businessman they're like yeah the world's tanking We're, we're telling you and that's why you need to stop drinking coffee and start paying up so that when jesus comes back you're in you have fire insurance i was thinking today about how religious conservatives will say like, it's not the government's job to house people and feed the hungry and clothe the naked, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's not their job. Stop making them do that. That's why we have religions and social support networks. And then it's like, oh, so you're saying that the religion should do it then, huh? It's like, okay, then religion's doing it. It's like, stop telling us what to do. It's not the religion's job to take Mm -hmm. care of people. Uh, The next line in this post is, they condescendingly seek to counsel the brethren whom they no longer sustain. As if you have to sustain somebody as a prophet, seer, and reveler, revelator in order to give them any amount of uh, feedback or criticism. Uh-huh. People do it in our comments all the time, and we don't <laughs> ask them to sustain I us. I know! You, you don't sustain me. <laughs> Well, even like, it's like, yeah, people criticize people when they see people doing bad behavior. What you're saying is... People, these peop- these specific people should be absolved of all criticism and are untouchable, because which is crazy. Do- <laughs> and when people do sustain them, you don't like when they criticize yeah. them either. There's no- so basically, yeah, you they are just supposed to be untouchable. Yeah, we don't uh, criticize. We, we do not criticize the leaders of the church, even if the criticism is true. Sit down, and HR. going back to your comparison about how people counsel us in the comment section all the time, <laughs> we have no money, next to no money, and considerably less influence. We're talking about a multi-billion dollar organization with one of the largest stock portfolios in the country or the world. I don't one know. of the largest private landowners yeah. in the country, the largest private landowner in the state of Florida. Enormous An influence. enormous p- political influence. And it's almost more insidious because like, okay, so Walmart, for example, is like a massive company with a ton of power, but they don't necessarily have like the kind of psychological influence that the Mormon church does. Like no. they, Walmart can't just like tell you all how to feel about something and you, everyone's going to go for it. Like that's mm-hmm. not going to work. They have to be like pretty neutral, at, like in, in a public facing way. Mm-hmm. But to have a, a multi, to have a company be so powerful and so rich and then also exert so much power over people's like private lives is very scary because where else do we see a multi-billion dollar organization having that kind of psychological influence in in such a personal way. I mean, it's just a lot, isn't it? And we can't move on without noting how Walmart 
pays more in yeah. humanitarian aid As a percentage per year of their income, yeah. than the church does. The post goes on. Confrontive, except of themselves, of course. They leave the church, but they cannot leave the church alone. I feel like we shouldn't even have to unpack this at this point, but it's perfectly valid to criticize the religion that you devoted decades of your life to. It's perfectly valid to... I mean, you don't have to leave the church alone. At a certain point, obviously, you got to, like, find a life outside of it. That's the whole point of leaving, right? But, I mean, we both have fully fledged lives outside of uh, even this channel. And so, and not everyone has a fucking YouTube channel that is like their kind of like main thing after they leave the church. Like that's pretty unique. And we still have fully fledged lives <laughs> outside of this. So it's like most people <laughs> do leave the church. You know what I'm saying? People should make fun of me for how much time I spend trying to engineer music. They should yeah. be like, you idiot, quit <laughs> that. You s trying to make that your whole personality, you suck. Just wanted to say how this underscores the church, uh, one of the problems with the church, which is the problem is you. It's always you, the individual. The church doesn't make mistakes, and even if they did, they wouldn't have to apologize. You, on the other hand, need to walk through the seven steps of repentance and humiliate yourself in front of a whole entire congregation, in front of this specific person, your local plumber or dentist, who you have to confess all your egregious, horrible, nightmarish sins to. Like... You're the problem, not the church. You need to look into yourself. It's like leaving the church is the most introspective. It's literally mm -hmm. taking charge of your interior world and being like, I cannot morally continue to do this. I am being dishonest to myself. I am allowing myself to be exploited and abused by this organization who is always making me their problem. <laughs> and also, I feel like a, not everyone, but a lot of us who have left Mormonism are very introspective because we're we're aware of that need to be, you know, like I'm not, I, I do believe everything starts with yourself. And so I don't criticize the LDS church and then live my life unwilling to examine myself. No, I'm doing constant self-reflection <laughs> too much. I think like, I think therapists would say that's too much. Tone it down, find other hobbies. Try to right? just be. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm very, as much, I don't live with the sort of, you know, shame repentance mindset anymore but I'm definitely always thinking about like how can I become more compassionate how is my ego showing up and sort of uh maybe negatively impacting my relationships or the way I you know I'm which exactly the doing... phenomenon you just described after divorce and after leaving yeah, the church exactly. of being like oh I need to practice being more empathetic and yeah so this, this I mean this is just a mischaracterization of so, mischaracterization of so many people because I think a lot of people that have left Mormonism are extremely engaged in their own healing and therefore are extremely engaged in like, how do I show up in the world? Am I kind enough? Am I kind enough to myself? Am I kind enough to others? You know, like constantly examining all these things and like, are my habits ethical? Like I'm an Amazon Prime customer. I think about it constantly. There's so I know, much. I bank at Wells Fargo. I'm like, I'm evil. <laughs> <laughs> but at least we acknowledge it. <laughs> Um, I mean, I went vegan after leaving the church because I was like, my my buying power is is contributing to an industry that is torturing sentient beings, and I am I can live great on a vegan <laughs> diet. So the the idea that people just leave the church and then they just become hedonists who just criticize Mormonism, but they don't ever criticize anything. It's like we're criticizing it all the whole fucking system all the time it's not even just mormonism you know it's capitalism it's patriarchy it's all of it who needs to take a harder look at themselves the average person taking charge of their internal world or the group of people who says that they are above criticism and ought not be criticized under any circumstances yeah exactly <laughs> Again, yeah, that's if, don't thing. substitute Jesus and Christ, substitute Jesus and Kevin, church and Kevin. If Kevin tells you... <laughs> it's so funny how how when you like learn about the concept of projection, you just see it constantly. Because yeah, this entire post, this Preach My Gospel Facebook post is saying, oh, they confront everything but themselves. And that is literally the exact vibe of this post is just like shitting on people they know nothing about, mischaracterizing them because they are not willing to examine themselves because as much as you hide behind the fact that like it's a church it's like but it's you it's like you feel like if i'm aligned with this church that means i'm moral if i'm doing what mormonism tells me to do i'm moral i don't really have to think beyond that and that is kind of the general vibe of mormonism isn't it like the throng on the ramparts of the great and spacious building they are intensely and busily preoccupied, pointing fingers of scorn at the steadfast iron rodders. I mean, I feel like we entered into this whole video because we were thinking about the fact that people are victims of Mormonism as an organization. Like the people that are still believing 
we might have our jokes and, you know, we, it's fun to roast sometimes, but I feel like we both have, and I think a lot of the ex-Mormon community has a lot of empathy for people that are believing Mormons and it's... Because we've all been there, but they have never been where we are. (laughs) Yeah, always a relevant point to bring up. Yeah, and so it's like, you know, do ex-Mormons scorn Mormons? Yeah, sure, that happens. Like, both communities do do that. But I would say in general, the vibe among all the ex-Mormons I know is there's a lot of empathy there and there is frustration and there can be anger, but then there's, alongside that, also the awareness that, like, but you know, my mum like truly believes this thing and has believed it her whole life. And like, if she left it, she would crumble. So she, how could she even entertain the idea that it's not true? You know, that empathy does exist. That kind of empathy does not exist on the Mormon side of things. And we know that because of the things the leaders say and the things that the Preach My Gospel official Facebook account says <laughs> and <laughs> blah de blah de blah Like they're not trying to understand, understand our perspective. No. <laughs> But I feel like we understand theirs because we were there. Like, we've been there. Considering their ceaseless preoccupation. Also, seriously, so many people leave Mormonism and don't talk about it. And, like, <laughs> truly just don't give a shit anymore. Like, you're the ones, that, like, that um, think that everyone's preoccupied because you are so preoccupied. Again, we are not the normal. <laughs> and even this, we only do on a Tuesday. <laughs> One wonders, is there no diversionary activity available to them, especially in such a large building? Like a bowling alley? This is apparently from Neil A. Maxwell's book, Become as a Child. It's a quote I've just realized. Perhaps in their mockings and beneath the stir are repressed doubts of their doubts. So whoa, funny because whoa, number one, I went whoa, bowling whoa, with whoa, Mormons whoa. just last weekend <laughs> and I had a great time. And also uh, in their mockings and beneath the stir are repressed doubts of their doubts. I feel like you're projecting it all. It's, it's all laid bare for us in that quote, isn't it? I love when people bring up, Mormons bring up the great and spacious thing. It's like, you're going to tell us we left the organization. We're the bad ones. You guys are literally famous around the world for building great and spacious buildings. Data. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what is a temple but a great and spacious building? What's that fucking conference center about where you get together and say shit like this about people in the evil, dark, wicked world who are so evil for pointing out the problematic things we're doing? It's like most people, again, leave the church and just go on with their lives and they talk about it because it is a fucking lot to process and it's okay for people who have been through abusive experiences and that is what the church experience is, is abusive and exploitative. It's in, Even if it were less so, it's okay for people to fucking talk about their life experiences. Mm-hmm. And for you to say like, oh, they make it their whole personality every time they talk about it. It's like, no, we talk about it every time y'all do something stupid. And if you would stop doing so many stupid things, it wouldn't be in the news all the time for like, oh, Mormon church member says that masturbation is like dying on a battlefield. It's like, haha, yeah, of course people are going to laugh at that. And it's not because you're persecuted. It's because that's fucking dumb or in worst case, horrible and harmful, which the church has ample examples of both. What is this thing that like, it, you have to belong to the organization to talk about it. If you spent mm. years of your life and uh, mm. tons of your money, large percentages of your money going to it, you're allowed to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously all of this is just um, an attempt to A, silence people from speaking out, but then B, to inoculate believers from listening to anyone who's speaking out. Because the very fact that they're speaking out invalidates them, right? Like, well, there's no better... Uh, strategy for keeping people shut off from outside information is telling them that literally the fact that people speak out is a sign that they are deceit you know Mm -hmm. ideal ideal i think that's it for today because this has gone so long Mm -hmm. but please join us on patreon if you want to read some 80s mormon fiction with us it's really fun it would make the devil so happy it's been good. It's been a good discussion. Thanks yeah. for hanging with us. Let us know your experiences. Yeah, we're always curious about what the Mormon experience is currently like or what it's been like for the last couple of years, you know. So if any of you are fresh out, very curious. Okay, thanks for watching. Love you. Catch you next time. Bye.